Hi everybody, this is Mr. Matthew and I'm here with the second video in our evolution series. This video is called Conditions for Darwin's Theory of Evolution by Natural Selection. We have a nice picture of the young Charles Darwin here over on the left and his famous initial sketchings of the tree uh, with the words I think there. And so in this one what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight uh, some of the conditions that are associated with uh, evolution by natural selection. Also throw out a couple key definitions to help uh, you know give a little bit of context as we go. So before we get started in the conditions, I want to talk first about the concept of fitness. So fitness is an organism's ability to survive and reproduce in a particular environment. So when we talk about natural selection, a lot of times it's referred to as survival of the fittest. And to be fit means you're able to survive an environment to the point of reproduction. So anytime we come across an organism that is successful, um, our, that's our definition of success for a group of organisms, making sure that they survive to the point of reproduction. For some organisms that will involve living for, you know, centuries in the case of some trees. In others it will be matters of minutes uh, that they're alive, but they're alive long enough to survive and pass on those genes to the next generation. So our general pattern here is that we have our initial um, organism highlighted up on the top and that organism is going to have offspring and those offspring are not going to all be the same. And so we have mutations create variation, although it's also important to know that uh, the gene shuffling that's associated with sexual reproduction will lead to variation as well. But some of those variations will not necessarily be able to survive and reproduce. And so those that are not favorable for the given condition will get selected against, and that's where we see the red X. And then those that do survive, they have the opportunity to reproduce. And as they do, we see the reproduction occurring and we see more organisms like that in the next generation. But conditions don't stay the same. They're not static in a given environment. So maybe the environment shifts again. And what we see is certain members of that population are selected against in a later population. And then what we see is uh, there's a shift again. So overall, what we see is these darker circles, in this case, tend to have the selective advantage. They are the fittest for whatever this given environment is. I don't know if you can really tell, but even in the case where what we see is, um, you know, say the light gray circle um, is having offspring, there is variation in its offspring. They're not exactly the same exact type of offspring when we take a look at them. And again, now that, that last line will then again reproduce and pass their genes on to the next generation. So another condition that is important for survival is that more offspring are produced than can be supported by a given environment. So here I have show a, an image of a frog and the frog is sitting on a frog egg mass. And so when we look at this, you can see that this individual frog has got tons and tons and tons of eggs, but only a small number of those eggs are actually going to survive to adulthood. In fact, most of those won't even get to the tadpole stage. So one of the key things that we look with specifically in wild populations is the reproductive potential of individual organisms far outstretches the number of offspring that they're going to produce in that next generation. And this is a really important idea because you have to have a lot of these organisms produced or a lot of offspring and so that only some are surviving and then the question is well which ones survive and those ones that survive are the ones that are again best able to compete for resources on average in that environment. Another key point is that when we look at the offspring um, of those eggs, or in this case we look at zebras or we look at seashells, what we end up seeing here is that there is hereditable variation among individuals, meaning not all of those eggs on that last slide were the same, not all of these zebras are the same, not all of these shells are the same, and they are different from one another, and they're different from one another based, how, based off of genetic differences within these organisms, something that they inherited. And since these organisms inherited these characteristics, the ones that survive will have genetic information that they will on average pass on to their offspring, or they will have genes that they will pass on to their offspring that allowed them to survive well, and therefore their offspring will have a higher likelihood of getting those same genes that allow them to survive. So another key factor that we look at with natural selection is that the variation leads to what we call differential fitness among individuals. So what we'll see is that there are organisms that are going to compete with one another 
for the resources in order to survive and reproduce. And so in this case, we have two different types of competition that may occur. Um, in this particular diagram, we see some cattails in the fore ground and we see some purple loosestrife in the back. When we look at, say, the cattails are in the foreground, those cattails are going to produce all of those seeds. So those corn dog looking things are going to make a giant seed mass and those seeds are going to land on the ground. And then all of those seeds are going to compete with one another. And so the competition between cattail with cattail is called intraspecific competition. Cattail with cattail to try to get space to grow, water, um, compete to get high enough to get light in order to perform photosynthesis. That's called intraspecific. Also, if I was to go to the background and look at those purple loosestrife plants, each of those individual purple loosestrife plants is going to produce tons and tons of seeds. Those seeds are going to land on the ground. They're going to compete with other uh, purple loosestrife plants to get access to water, to space, and that uh, that sort of thing. That's called intraspecific. That intra refers to within the species. So when we look at the cattails competing with the purple loosestrife, that's called interspecific. And that's where different species are competing for the same water, space, and so forth. And in that particular case, uh, we're going to see which organism are be better able to survive and reproduce. And they're totally different gene pools. Obviously, this example brings up the idea of invasive species, of the purple loosestrife, and a lot of other concepts that will tie to some ecological things that we'll talk about later on. All right, next concept we talk about is the shift towards an increase in the proportion of individuals with um, advantageous heritable traits. So this is the same diagram we looked at earlier. And the key thing that we talk about here is that when individuals have offspring, their offspring, particularly when we're going to do this through uh, sexual reproduction, the offspring are not identical to the parents. And so what that means is that the parents are going to, on average, pass on the favorable traits that they had, but there is still going to be some variation. And so as those with unfavorable traits uh, die off and those that have the favorable traits survive, we're going to tend to see shifts within the population towards a higher percentage of the favorable traits. There will still continue to be variation. It's just that the variation is going to have more individuals with the favorable traits and fewer of the unfavorable traits. Um, again, this is not making it so that all organisms have whatever it was that that key trait. Um, there's still going to be variations. It's just a shift towards the, on average, having the better traits. So in summary, uh, when we look at the conditions necessary for um, natural selection, uh, we're going to see that after this video you should be able to construct an explanation based on evidence that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection occurs in populations when the following conditions are met. More offspring are produced than can be supported by the environment. That idea of competition amongst those large numbers of offspring is a key component, but you got to have large numbers of offspring first. There is a hereditable variation among the individuals. Individuals have a difference that is underlying them that is genetic. And lastly, some of these vari variations lead to differential fitness among individuals as some individuals are better able to compete for limited resources than others. So when we have those variations, certain variants are going to be uh, better suited to that environment in that very competitive environment that is um, the wild couple of clarification statements. Um, you know, the emphasis really is, and I sort of hit that on that last slide, is that the overall result of an increase in the proportion of those individuals with advantageous tra traits are better able to survive than reproduce. So it's in really important to know that when we have this competition with one, within one generation and only certain traits are really going to be favorable, those offspring are not all necessarily going to have the same trait. There's going to be variation in that next generation even though the parents had a favorable trait, not all the offspring will have it. And so we'll still end up having sort of a bell curve of variation with many different traits. And, and that's really important because the environment does not stay the same. And if there is a shift in the environment, um, you still are going to have some individuals that um, lack certain traits or have extra of certain traits if there is a future change in that population. All right, I hope this was helpful for you guys. This is video two. Um, I'll be back soon with video three.